how strong does the constantly leveling up Sung Jin Woo actually get by the end of solo leveling? In other words, what's his full power and final form look like? I'll be going over exactly that in this video, so make sure to stay tuned for that. Channel the Monarch with it and smash that like button if you enjoy seeing solo leveling videos on the channel. I want to keep them coming. Make this the video you subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss future solo leveling videos and updates. And now, without further ado, let's jump into it, spoilers and all. So it may seem weird to start this video with Jin Woo's death at the hands of the Frost Monarch, but this quote-unquote death is ironically what unlocks his full power. We're even told by the system that the player has died. However, we're told after that that the player possesses the Black Heart and that death is actually a requirement to activate a certain unknown passive skill. In a dream world at level 146, Jinwoo talks to the Shadow Monarch, the cause of his initial power boost from E-Rank. The Shadow Monarch says he is a record of Jinwoo's struggles, the evidence of his resistance, and the reward for his pain. He is also death, eternal slumber, and terror. He reveals that at this point, he and Jinwoo are one and the same. Thus, they are both the King of the Dead who rules over death and governs the deepest depths of darkness. In the Shadow Monarch's insane backstory, he explains how he was the only messenger of God who stood against against the rebels aka the other fragments of brilliant light who wanted to kill the supreme being because he wouldn't stop the fighting and dying that resulted from the ongoing war between the light and darkness which was represented by the eight monarchs. The shadow monarch who wasn't the shadow monarch yet had his army with him but they were ultimately defeated by the others. However instead of dying like with Jin Wu he realized that the absolute being had hidden a power within him. That is how the shadow monarch the ninth monarch was born within the body of the most loyal fragment of light. He arose his army, now a shadow army, but by the time he overpowered the enemy and reached the supreme being, the supreme being was already dead. He joined forces with the monarchs to bring down the beings that killed his god. Time was on his side since the corpses and souls left on the battlefield became part of his army. He eventually came to the point where he and his shadow army stood shoulder to shoulder with the strongest of the monarchs, the monarch of dragons and his destruction army. The problem though is that with his great power, the rulers but also the monarchs came to fear him and to two other monarchs teamed up to beat him. He was betrayed by the monarch of Fangs and Baran, the monarch of White Flames, and the king of the demons. He says his shadow army was almost obliterated, but at the end of the day, the monarch of Fangs ran away and he killed Baran, the king of the demons. After this battle, the fragments of light, now calling themselves the rulers, appeared. You might think they came to take down the shadow monarch while he was weak from battle, but no, they bowed down to him and said, please forgive us greatest fragment of brilliant light. They were capable of sending him back to nothingness, the monarch says, but they wished to make peace. It's also noted that the shadow monarch once led the army of brilliant light on the front lines and so it's not surprising that they showed him such respect. The monarch begged to be erased from existence but the rulers refused. He was confused. He couldn't make a decision so he decided to go into hiding in order to plan his revenge. He had already confined the monarch of white flames within his shadows so he planned to attack the monarch of fangs his army after his body recovered. But while hiding, the monarchs were defeated by the rulers. When he appeared before the monarchs who had escaped to a dimensional gap to focus on boosting their combat power, they didn't want to fight. They accepted him knowing, as I mentioned, that it was time to boost their power and not to fight and decrease it. So the Shadow Monarch, still confused, decided to join the Monarchs and sought out a world where they could build a new army out of the sight of the rulers. That place was Earth. Now you might be confused about why the Shadow Monarch would even entertain the idea of turning against the people that spared him, but again, these are the guys that killed his master and god. Another thing to keep in mind in this post-Supreme Being world, the rulers were the maintainers of worlds, while the Monarchs were the destroyers of worlds. By the time the rulers sent their soldiers after the Monarchs, the world was already destroyed, meaning planet Earth. They were furious the monarchs destroyed another world and used a forbidden device with the absolute being's power, aka the cup of reincarnation, to turn back time 10 years. They created beings who could survive the collision of the two great forces known as hunters. That is how desperately they wanted to protect mankind. However, the problem is that no matter how many times time was turned back, both sides retained their memories. So the rulers, but also the monarchs, are tirelessly refining their plans. Similar to how rulers strengthened this world and made it better able to withstand mana by lending humans their power and scattering mana by killing magic beasts, the monarchs borrowed the bodies of humans to descend upon the earth and had their armies 
armies arrive much sooner than the rulers expected. Back to power though, and the shadow and dragon monarchs were so strong that they couldn't find a host. In other words, they couldn't find a human that could withstand their powers. So a skilled mage working under one of the kings came to the shadow monarch with a proposal. He offered to find him a suitable human. In return, the mage called the architect, who we'd recognize from the double dungeon, asked for immortality. Since no living thing could become a vessel for death, the architect designed a system to search for a human who was highly responsive to mana, someone with a superior physique and a strong mentality. It wasn't easy though to find someone who could be death's avatar. And that's when the shadow monarch noticed a human who had stepped beyond the boundaries of the system that the architect had created. A human who had deviated from its rules and expectations. Jinwu was weak and always within death's reach, and yet always managed to escape with his life. The monarch kept watching and despite the disapproval of the architect, he chose Jinwu to be his vessel. So the architect made it possible for him to adapt to his strength using what humans do best, recreation and games. Importantly, the system was built using the shadow monarch's powers and it succeeded in gradually changing Jinwu's body so that he could accommodate the monarch's full power. So yes, there is no game in actuality, it was just a tool created using the monarch's power and the architect's magic skills to make Jinwu a fit vessel. When Jinwu asked why the shadow monarch betrayed the architect, he says, an apology from the rulers versus the betrayal of the monarchs. After putting off choosing a side for quite some time, he came to a decision. After spending time with Jinwu, it brought him so much happiness. Perhaps he did not want to lose Jinwu. He became Jinwu and Jinwu became him. Since they became the same person, he says, he'll let Jinwu decide. Jinwu can stay in death's domain in the dream world or go back to reality and face his foes. When asked why the shadow monarch went with the other monarchs and left the rulers in the past, he simply replies, and I quote, because there was no place for me there, end quote. Then the monarch passes the shadow monarch mantle, so to speak, and says he will return to eternal rest, while Jin Wu, who has decided to return, will become the new fully fledged shadow monarch and live as an immortal. He tells Jin Wu that with death, Jin Wu's power has become absolute. So how strong is this version of Jin Wu, who pretty much just used a rise on himself? Well, let's look at his feats. We're quickly told that the system will now be deleted and that all power limits set on the player will be lifted. His shadow soldiers also get boosts as we're told that Igris's power has been restored and that the skills of Beru, commander level shadow, have significantly increased. Meanwhile, the monarch of shadows, Ashborn, has returned to the world of eternal nothingness, we're told. So Jinwu is reawakened and immediately, like before, the monarch of fangs gets scared just feeling his power and decides to run again. He says he only agreed to fight the human form since since the real shadow monarch power is on the way, he no longer has an obligation to keep his promise. When the monarch of frost calls him out, he just says, nah, you wouldn't understand since you never faced the monarch of shadows true power. Just as he's preparing to launch a giant ice attack on the entire area, Beru destroys the attack. At this point, it's clear in Jinwu's presence that there is an insurmountable wall in terms of power between Jinwu and the Frost Monarch. The Frost Monarch puts all his power into a single attack and tries to use an opening he thinks he sees, but Jinwu effortlessly stops the attack. To himself, he says, so this is the power of the greatest fragment of brilliant light and one of the most powerful monarchs there is. However, Jinwu says he'll save the Frost Monarch for later and decides to chase down the Beast Monarch, aka the Monarch of Fangs first. He chases down and kills the beast monarch in a few minutes and brings back his fangs as proof. He then quickly finishes off the frost monarch. Clearly he's so much stronger now that he can treat these monarchs who are significantly stronger than even national ranked heroes like mere playthings. Obviously we know what side the new shadow monarch Jinwu would ultimately choose between the rulers and monarchs. Since the ones he loves are on earth he would protect them from the monarchs and so he would by default be on the side of the rulers who also want to protect the world. Soon after he flexed on the two monarchs in a matter of minutes he witnesses new shadow soldiers coming through portals. As it turns out, this insanely big army is the same one he saw in flashbacks. It's Ashborn's old army and now they're at his disposal in addition to the army he built. He gets Grand Marshal Belion, who is stronger than Beru and multiple shadow dragons. Thus in theory, looking at the sizes of their shadow armies, Jin was actually already stronger than Ashborn with this combined larger army. As is pointed out, only one of the three shadow dragons that we see could wipe the human race off the planet and now they all serve Jin Wu. Then you might think by now that Jin Wu is untouchable, but that's not really the case, at least not yet. As was known during Ashborn's time too, Ashborn and the Dragon King were spoken of as being the strongest of monarchs. Ashborn was never spoken of as being stronger than the Dragon King and the fight is, if anything, more challenging than most of us probably expected it to be for our overpowered protagonist. As the Great War gets underway, the Dragon King can sense that the Shadow Monarch is becoming 
stronger as he fights and creates more shadow soldiers out of his slain opponents. He decides that because of that, the time to attack is now. So during chapter 173, the battle between these two finally begins. But Jin Wu uses a strategy to separate the Dragon King from his much larger army. He uses a skill that he got from the Rune of Kamish, Dragon's Fear. He paralyzed the dragon's army as he made the two monarchs teleport to the other side of the world. So then the dragon king says, ah, so this fight depends on whether I can hold out until my troops find me, end quote. So Jinwoo is not overpowered enough to think he can take on the dragon king and his 10 million soldier army. And although his army increases as he kills and turns his opponents into shadow soldiers, he also doesn't have unlimited mana. So he needs to be wary of running out against such a strong opponent and such a big army. It seems like Jinwoo and his shadow army has the upper hand until the dragon king uses his own dragon's fear roar on Jin Wu's soldiers. It forces Jin Wu to unsummon his soldiers. The dragon king then shows off his true power and reintroduces himself as the king of berserk dragons and a monarch of destruction and Terry's. And Jin Wu notes that not even an immortal soldier would be able to withstand a blast of his fire breath. At this point, the Dragon King recognizes Jin Wu's great power. He says, and I quote, You possess an ability different from Ashborn's, and in that ability I see our glorious victory, end quote. And he's talking about their victory against the rulers who want to kill the monarchs. The Dragon King even offers to spare Jin Wu's family, or even his country. He even says his soldiers will quietly take their leave if he wants them off this planet. He offers him the position of becoming the monarch of Earth. Jin Wu is not even considering that though. Maybe because he knows that the monarchs want destruction and the rulers want to maintain life, but he also knows that the monarchs can't be trusted as they have already betrayed Ashborn in the past. So he just says, Don't make me laugh. You expect me to trust someone whose eyes are looking at me with bloodlust. The fighting resumes and Jin Wu sees that his dagger attacks don't even leave a scratch on the dragon's body. Jin Wu has to admit that the dragon king's attacks and defenses are much stronger than those of any other opponent he's faced. He realizes that he needs something stronger. So then Jin Wu wraps his body with the power of darkness and attempts to create an armor that is much bigger and stronger than the dragons. He says he'll be so massive that every living thing on this planet will seem tiny by comparison. The dragon is shocked asking if this is spiritual body manifestation. He says, could it be that he has summoned the power of death to this planet? He's shocked that a human could wield the power of death to this extent. Jin Wu meanwhile comes to the conclusion that this must be the truth true power of the shadow monarch that Ashborn left with him. He can feel terrifying bottomless power surging endlessly within this massive form. The Dragon King realizes that this is possible because even though he was given new powers, Jin Wu has spent quite a bit of time on the border between life and death. He has been fighting a battle on his own in order to survive. This is why Ashborn was able to pass on the entirety of his powers to a quote unquote mere human. The Dragon King decides that Jin Wu is much too dangerous after seeing all this and decides he must do away with him at once. Jin Wu's shadow attack then cuts through the Dragon King's fire blast and hits him. Doesn't slow down the Dragon King much though, and then they engage in close combat with their giant forms. Eventually though, after exchanging blows, Jin Wu needs to return to his normal form, and it's remarked that the mere act of maintaining such immense power is incredibly draining. Still, it isn't over. Jin Wu instead wraps his normal body with the shadow slash death armor, while the Dragon King turns back into his humanoid form and is in his own dragon looking armor. Jin Wu, with his daggers clashing, with the Dragon King's sword. The Dragon King asks him, does he want to be burned to ashes by the flames that can incinerate death itself? Implying that Jin Wu, despite being death incarnate, could potentially die. Jin Wu loses his daggers in battle as the Dragon King stabs him. Jin Wu is still standing though, and he tries a sneak attack with a levitating dagger, but the Dragon King simply replies, did you really think that a dagger made from a dragon's fang could stab me, the Dragon King, as he effortlessly stops the attack? Then Jin Wu summons his shadow soldiers all at once and they hold down the Dragon King as he seemingly slashes him in half vertically. He uses his father's own weapon to do it. Now the Dragon King admits that Jin Wu won but it's not necessarily because Jin Wu overpowered him. The Dragon King seems to be regenerating from the slash but Jin Wu's strategy of using the force of their powers clashing to tear this space apart and call forth the rulers from the other side is what ensured the Dragon King's defeat whether Jin Wu himself was to die or not. The rulers are the ones to finish the Dragon King off by stabbing him. He disintegrates as a result and goes to the true world of eternal slumber and not, he says, to the fake one that the Shadow Monarch created. So you might say that Jin Wu got help in this fight, which some might argue taints his victory, but don't worry. He decides to use the Cup of Reincarnation to turn back time one more time so that he can defeat all of the monarchs by himself in the dimensional rift. 
In this way, he would spare all the damage and lives lost during this war, including that of his own father. He's insanely confident too, saying to the rulers, and I quote, please don't send anyone to Earth after turning back the clock, end quote. In the new timeline, he fights and wins against the monarchs, all by himself. He defeats the monarch of Transfiguration, who can be especially tricky as we saw, 27 years go by in the Dimensional Rift, and Jinwoo now has a cool new shadow armor form, letting us know he's changed and stronger than ever. It's not just his army that has grown over 27 years of killing the monarchs and their armies, but also his experience, and thus he can use his powers better than ever before. Although it happens off screen, Jinwoo does end up defeating the Dragon King without the help of the rulers this time. The Dragon King scarred Jinwoo's hand, but other than that, Jinwoo comes back to Earth in perfect condition. The ruler vessel that welcomes him back as the victor can sense the weight of millions of soldiers marching along with each step he takes. Keep in mind, his old army was about 100,000 strong, so the army has grown way, way larger than it's ever been. It's crazy to think about. But now comes a new issue. Is there a place for such a powerful being in a world without magic or even hunters? the rulers are worried about the effect his power will have on the earth. Jinwoo's power is so great now that he's told the earth can't handle it. Since time was turned back, the world is without mana and thus fragile. Thus, they'd like to transport him to another world that can handle his power. Jinwoo feels like nuclear fuel that has become dangerous toxic waste at the end of its life cycle. He saved the world from threats, and now he's the remaining threat that needs to be disposed of. It's like he's served his purpose and the world has no use for him anymore. However, he rejects this view. The passing by of his future wife Cha helps him realize that one reason he should stay on Earth is that the people he loves are still here, as well as the people who love him. Besides, we know how confident our protagonist is, and he's confident that he can deal with the threats that may come as a result of his great power. And that's the end of the main story. But we're going into the epilogue too, because there's more important information about how strong he actually gets there. During the epilogue chapters, Jin Wu is told about how the threat of the Titans is coming to Earth. The Titans are a giant race that went to the world of the rulers in previous timelines, but this time they're coming to Earth, and it's assumed that it's because they're chasing Jin Wu's great power. Power. The rulers think about sending help, but Jinwoo says, nah, he'll do it himself. When they appear, there are seemingly countless giants that Jinwoo has to take down with his own shadow army. But he is unfazed. He even begins turning some of the defeated titans into new shadow soldiers as well. We see that like Luffy from One Piece, he can now use his shadow powers to create giant limbs while his normal body stays the same size. In other words, he doesn't need to transform his whole body into that giant form we saw when he fought the Dragon King. If he needs to, he can just create a giant shadow arm that he uses to pin down one of the stronger titans. This suggests that he's gaining better control of his already impressive powers. Remember, before he said that the giant form was draining, but this flexible use of that great power seems to be a solid workaround. Even the arrogant titan must admit, so even a small planet on the galactic outskirts has quite the useful talent. At no point does Jinwoo struggle, and there are even jokes thrown in, like when his soldiers take out Jinwoo's opponent when the titan is bragging about his final form and full power. The titans, despite being strong enough to worry a race, as strong as the rulers, are so not a challenge for Jin Wu that they are finished off screen. Later, as high ranking officials on Earth are discussing Jin Wu, they explain that our protagonist dealt with those monsters as if they were toys. So, right now, Jin Wu is looking pretty untouchable, but maybe Jin Wu's son can beat him, right? After all, as you know if you watched my Jin Wu and Cha's Relationship Explained video, his son's mother was the strongest female hunter in Korea. Those are some insanely overpowered genes when you think about it. In contrast, Jin Wu's own mother was pretty frail. So when his son is ready, Jinwoo creates a familiar training game for him, where his son can face his many shadow soldiers. As he levels up, the challenges get more difficult until he has to face Jinwoo himself. The final boss, if you will. Even though his son has leveled up enough to at least tie Jin Wu in theory, in practice things don't go like that. The focus is not on the sheer strength that comes with fully leveling up, but on how refined Jin Wu's attacks are. As his son asks himself, just how hard do you have to work? How many deaths do you have to overcome in order to have that kind of skill? He thinks to himself, and I quote, my stats have reached their limits, and my combat ability has developed far enough to handle those stats, end quote. Yet when he goes to attack Jin Wu, he suddenly loses, as Jinwoo tells him it's still too early for him. He'll have to continue his training. So at the end of the manhwa, Jinwoo is still the strongest, and not just because he's so powerful, but because through experience he refined his skills so that he's still way more effective than someone with similarly maxed out stats. Yes, eventually his son will probably surpass him, Jinwoo will probably pass on the torch if you will, but in the canon established by the manhwa, including the manhwa's epilogue chapters, Jinwoo is the strongest, period. 
I mean, the dude is so strong that he attracts strong opponents only to flex on them when they eventually do show up. And if you enjoyed this video on Jinwoo's powers, then you won't want to miss my video about his no less interesting love life with Cha. Link on screen right now. Like and subscribe for more soul leveling, and I'll see you in the next one.